We're talking about leading with compassion and clarity during COVID. So hopefully you can see here on the screen, we've got a statement here, the way managers lead through crisis today will set their organizations up for success or failure for the next 10 years. People have long memories and will remember how you listened, cared, and responded during this pandemic. And it's a true point in time where folks can have a big impact on how the company will be perceived, how leaders will be viewed in the next couple of years, because people will remember. Just a quick note, years ago, I was a lot younger, skinnier, and just kind of starting out. I remember talking to a guy, and he was saying how the leadership team had fired somebody and how terrible they were, and they brought people in and made them clear out their desks, and he was just extremely angry about it. And so I'm asking about it, talking about it, and I'm like, well, when did this happen? And he said, oh, I was about 22, 23 years ago. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, they've had five different company changes since then. 23 years later, this guy is still thinking about how they were mistreated and can't let it go. But I've seen positive sides, too, where people say, you know, lost a loved one of the leaders were caring and asking me how I was doing. People remember these things. So particularly for you business owners, but anyone listening on this that's in a leadership role. You all are going through your own stressors. You've got your own family issues. You've got your own things to deal with, I get. But how you lead and how you show compassion for the folks that are reporting to you will be remembered. So it's an opportunity, if you look at it that way, for setting things up for the next five, 10 years. On the next slide, just a couple notes here in terms of stress and fatigue. I don't think we realize how much stress affects us. I mean, we all talk about stress as a bad thing. And right now, of course, with COVID, you've got work-life balance issues. You've got, in some cases, uncertain job status and security. Family members, I know I've been affected by having a family member impacted by COVID. I mean, there's a lot of stress there. And then the thing we don't realize is stress shuts us down. Any athlete knows when you start getting tight, your performance goes down. We're the same way on the job. Stress decreases brain volume. If you look at the third bullet, it actually shrinks your brain. And it's no wonder our decision-making is impacted, judgment, attention, memory, risk-taking behavior goes up. We just don't operate the same under stress. And that leads to a greater chance of getting hurt on or off the job or just driving into work. And fatigue's a part of that, too. You'll notice there, 17 straight hours working is essentially the same as being legally drunk. 265% greater chance of getting hurt if you're getting less than five hours of sleep. And if you look here near the bottom of this, in 2018, when they started asking young folks about serious mental distress, 4% of people 30 years and younger said they were impacted by it. After COVID, those numbers jumped up to 38%. You wouldn't believe it seeing all the kids at the beaches during this time doing dumb things, but the stress is affecting young folks in particular. It's affecting all of us. And if you can see there at the bottom, interactive discussions building relationships, a little more appreciation and recognition decreases stress. Those are specific things as leaders we can do to try to help our folks out. So on the next slide, quickly, you'll notice here, prioritizing your own mental health, taking care of yourself is important. As a parent, as a leader, you got to get your own, basically act together to make sure that you're taking care of yourself first before you can take care of others and removing the stigma. That's a big issue in a podcast for another day. There's nothing wrong asking for help when you need it. It's a sign of strength, not weakness. And so as leaders, you showing vulnerability is good, making sure that your programs internally are set up. If people do have issues, they've got a place to go to talk about it. You want to have flexibility. You want to have the work-life balance. Empathy and active caring are important and then connecting employees to other resources. These are some specific things you all as leaders can do to help your folks out as we move through this pandemic. On the next slide, there was a book written years ago. It's a good one if anyone's curious, called The Checklist Manifesto. And I did years of research back at the university and after looking at the use of behavioral checklists to influence behavior and reduce injuries. Checklists work. They get us focused. My analogy for this is if my wife says, go to the store and get some eggs and bacon and milk and whatever, if I don't have my checklist, I come home with beer and ho-hos and french fries or whatever. And she's like, you know, where's the milk? Yeah, I forgot. Having the checklist helps me. Checklists help people focus on the things they need to be doing. My suggestion would be look at this checklist and create your own. But these are some quick hitter reminders we should be doing regularly with our folks. Things like creating an open environment. In 20 plus years of doing this, 
physical safety is primarily the focus. Don't get hurt or killed on the job. But psychological safety is coming up more and more. People need to feel free to speak up to their direct bosses, to whoever else it is, if they've got concerns, if they've got issues. If they have suggestions, sometimes the best ideas you get are from people that are on the front line. So creating an open environment is important. Being transparent about current realities, let folks know where, you know, what's going on with the business, what's going on with your plans. Be as open and transparent as you can be. Checking in more often is a big one, too. People are stressed out. Sometimes working from home, they may be more isolated. And if folks have some underlying conditions, anxiety, depression, et cetera, those can be exacerbated in these conditions. So checking in more is a smart move. And then other things listed, good listening skills, setting up forms for open question and answer, being more patient with mistakes. We're making more mistakes now. As mentioned before, stress creates mistakes. And so we need to be a little more patient with folks. And that last point there is thanking folks for hanging in there. Appreciation, respect, And positive recognition, just a quick note, I don't want to get in the weeds on this from an academic standpoint, but recognition is often perceived by people as this kumbaya, hippy-dippy, give peace a chance, fairy dust and unicorns and rainbows. Recognition is behavioral science. If you want to influence behavior, recognize people for the good things they're doing. They're more apt to do it in the future. We do it with our kids. For some reason, we don't do it enough with each other. So recognition is always a good idea. And during this pandemic, it's even more important. So next slide. And again, I don't want to go kind of a death by PowerPoint here and kill you all with reading all this stuff out. But I think it's a smart move. In addition to the previous checklist for general overall things you should be doing. These are some specific guidelines for COVID, like entry stations with temperature checks, having cleaning schedules that are being followed. PPE guidelines, physical distancing, et cetera. I think it's a smart move if you haven't already to get that list set up. Again, that's something you should create yourselves and make sure you've got a responsible party making sure these things are done. That will be reassuring as well to your folks because they know that you all are going through behaviorally specifically and handling these issues. A couple more slides here before we open it up to a little bit of uh, Q&A here. Just an example, I mentioned earlier the importance of leadership during this time. Here's kind of the good and the bad tale of two cities. In one case, you've got a meatpacking company where almost half of the 2,000 people there tested positive for COVID, and they were still bringing people in, even though they knew those specific people had it. In one case, a guy was working there. His wife died from COVID working at the same facility, and they never said any condolences. They didn't send flowers. They didn't do anything. They didn't even acknowledge it. And so you can see the quote at the end there, they don't care about us, they only care about the money. And that company now is under big scrutiny because the media got a hold of it. So they're taking a hit from a brand perspective because they just didn't care. The flip side is a financial organization. Hopefully this hits with some of you all here on the call. But this organization did all kinds of good things. They were providing immediate paid medical leave if you got diagnosed sending employees who self-identified as being high-risk home with pay, $1,200 tax-free checks to cover working from home, full coverage for testing, and that's physical and mental health services too, child care support. And again, their folks and the employees that were interviewed for that story were glowing about their company. And we have companies now we're working with because we do a lot of different kinds of work with companies, Six Sigma implementations, process improvements, et cetera. And we can tell a difference between those companies that are really doing the right thing and those folks that are struggling. The people working there are telling us. So it's important to set the right tone. So last couple of thoughts here. First, make sure we're setting the right example, wearing masks ourselves and making sure we're following all guidelines. We need to be more aware that people are under pressure. They're under stress. And part of that is speaking up and making sure that we are showing compassion. Lou Holtz, For any of you college football fans that may be disappointed, it looks like the season's probably not going to happen. But Lou Holtz had a quote, something to the effect of, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And that caring and compassion and speaking up more is a big part of setting the right tone as we navigate through this. So I'll just leave you with the last slide here. These are some helpful resources, some guidelines that people can go to if they are struggling. And this is something you can send out to your folks as a resource. Hopefully you have internal resources too. But again, I think the last thing I'll leave you with now before we do a little bit of Q&A here is just 
appreciation. We're all struggling. We're all going through it. And I know many of you on this call are dealing with your own pressures as best you can handle them, as best as you can show support and compassion and caring for your folks. It's going to set you up well now, but it's also going to be remembered, as I said earlier, five, 10 years down the road. Thank you, Josh. Your presentation was very, very, very good. And I appreciate you taking the time to go over it. One of the things that we deal with in our industry, in the financial service industry, an uh, important aspect that has shined through and become more prevalent, especially with the COVID crisis, is a lot of the firms that we work with, uh, in some cases, it's mandatory and required that you have to have a business continuity disaster recovery plan per your previous slide, of important checklists of things to follow if there were, especially now, if there was an, a business continuity issue, what you should do to follow. But one of the things that it's never really been at the forefront of my mind is the messaging that goes with that when you're discussing business continuity and disaster recovery. In the future, is it better to be more proactive, having quarterly meetings, annual meetings to discuss once the COVID situation is rectified? Is it, in your opinion, a good idea for these firms to emphasize business continuity efforts so everyone's on the same page and you're sending a good message across the board proactively on a yearly or quarterly basis? What is your opinion regarding how firms should they handle that going forward? Yeah, I would do it as much as possible. I would do it to the point where people start saying, look, we're hitting too many meetings on this. Over-communication. Okay. Overcommunication uh-huh. is a better way to go than you can backtrack from there versus the opposite. Because again, if people aren't aware of what's going on with continuity plans, if they're feeling like they're in the dark, that's just going to create more anxiety. So my advice yeah. would be do too much of it and then back off as needed. Okay. And then when a crisis hits, obviously, like we're going through now with every business and a financial service firm out there, how often do you have this discussion about where this messaging about where we're at, being transparent, how the business is going, how business continuity is going and so forth? Is that something that you recommend on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? Or how do you determine the fine line when you're going through a crisis is the best way to communicate with your employees as far as that's concerned? Yeah, I think you need to have some kind of steering team or some kind of COVID team or at least a group of folks that are in charge of it meeting all the time. I mean, they should be at least weekly meetings. And in some cases, as I mentioned, college football, it changes day to day. So I think yeah. that team will be meeting all the time on an ongoing basis, making adjustments as needed. We do the leadership side of it. There may be resources out there, too, in terms of some of the logistics with the continuity plan, et cetera. And if you're getting help there, that should be done regularly as well. But that communication needs to be constant right now. And it's just a reality. We've got a second job. Some people have their regular job plus a second job of dealing with this. And that's just yeah. the reality of it right now, unfortunately. But again, over communication and back off is needed. Awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. You know, I have one hypothetical. We're going to be dealing with this COVID thing. I'm scared to say for probably for a long time, and there's probably going to be flare ups here and there across the country for, you know, several months down the road. If I was an office manager or CEO and I had, say, a staff of 15, 20 back office personnel, and then one of my staff members calls in sick on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and then he gives me a call and said, hey, I just got my results back. I got tested over the weekend. I came up positive with COVID. What steps should that manager immediately do from right there, seeing that his staff might have been potentially exposed to pre-symptomatic or somebody might be asymptomatic in the office? Just to be clear, and I don't want to, but, you know, from our perspective, we're in the leadership game and we're in the, to be honest, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. And we're trying to deal with the realities of COVID. So there may be specific detail, what if scenarios where I would frankly talk to some resources and experts you have on that. All I'll say is having more rotating split shifts to try to minimize those changes, redesign workplaces as best you can to avoid it. But you should have folks and experts COVID experts that you're on the phone with regularly as part of that steering team I mentioned earlier that's connecting with those folks regularly for specific A, B, C, D, and E. I can help you on the leadership side, on the dealing with people side. When we start getting into the weeds on that, frankly, your audience is going to be better talking to specific COVID health professionals. So sorry, I don't mean to dance around the issue. That's just the truth. Okay. Okay. Well, we have a lot of firms that are working remotely now. 
what type of method should a manager employ to help keep morale up and productivity of the staff going? I know some people, they really do like the office environment and working from home can kind of drive them crazy. So what can a manager do to help keep up morale and make sure everybody's still productive and happy? Yeah, it's a challenge. Keeping up your own morale is half the battle, I think. But yeah, so I mentioned earlier, more check-ins with employees to see how they're doing again to the point where they're like, all right, I got it. I don't need to talk to you every other day. I'm good. But more check-ins are important. I mentioned the showing, the caring, the authentic compassion. People have good BS detectors. And if I don't feel like you care, I sense it. I'm smart. You know, people are smart. They get it. So genuine caring, asking how people are doing, actively listening if they've got concerns, showing empathy, but also responding to it in quick and effective responses to concerns that people bring up is a good way of showing caring. I heard you. I listened to you. We're making changes here, here, and here to try to cope with it. In some cases, I may not be able to fix the problem, but I'm doing my best to deal with it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, recognition, appreciation is not this touchy-feely thing. It is smart business. It's intelligent business. It's good for safety. It's good for health. It's good for the bottom line financially too. So make sure that we're recognizing and thanking folks for working hard in these difficult conditions. It is kind of a year for the books. There's been a lot of changes that have happened. Do you foresee like there might be a change in the office environment in the future because of the pandemic? to maybe more remote offices or different spacing or something to that effect? Yeah, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, it's really going to be interesting to see. I think so. I mean, I know a lot of the clients that we're working with, just so you all know, I mean, we're being told because most of our work traditionally has been done on site. You know, we're a safety and health consulting firm. We spend a lot of time doing assessments. We do a lot of training on site. And we're doing a lot of that remotely now. I've been doing the home office for 20 years, so it's not new for me. But we've got folks telling us we're not going to have people on site for a year. So for, at least in the, in the foreseeable future, it's going to be there. My guess is as companies start realizing we can be pretty darn effective and productive with home offices, I think it is. I really believe it's going to change the nature of work down the road because you don't have the distractions. You don't have the overhead from a cost perspective. There's a lot of benefits from working from home if you get conscientious people working for you. So the short answer is yes. I think it's going to change the landscape of how people work. I think there's going to be a lot more working from home in the future. That's an interesting point that the transition is going to be more working from home. But then at the same time, you have to be cautious because working from home and being isolated has also got its negative effects on people. I know I was used to working with a coworker and that's part of the camaraderie of building rapport with your team is being sometimes face-to-face is a great way of communicating and making sure you can read the people to see where they're at from a mental perspective, whether it's work-related or whatnot, and you can read the people and see how they're doing, how they're handling their stress and stuff. Now, even with video calls, I think you can still see that, but it's still in an impersonal nature. But from your perspective, Josh, is there things that you're employing or planning to employ with the move to more remote working conditions as far as like specialized training on how people can interact better via remote settings? Yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of with the Zoom meetings, it helps to a certain degree, but it's not the same. I think it's even more important. That's part of the reason for regular check-ins. I think picking up the phone and calling people as well is important just to kind of see how things are going. But yeah, we're doing a lot of soft skills training now. And part of that, I think we as a company internally will be working on how to maintain that human touch when you can't be with people in person. So yeah, that's going to be a challenge, I think, for a lot of folks. Okay. Well, Josh, thank you so much for taking time again to be part of our podcast. We really appreciate the presentation that you've given. Is there anything that you'd like to, uh, any new events that are going to be up on your radar that some of our audience members may want to be pay attention to? Are you taking part in any conferences or webinars or virtual conferences or anything like that where they can follow you and take part in any additional events that you're taking part in? I think I direct folks to our website. Again, I want to thank everyone for listening. I want to thank you, Ivan and Colin, for the invite to do this. We've written a bunch of articles on COVID. I hopefully at least gave folks two or three things to consider. But if you go to our website, propolo.com, there's a lot of information there. You can see about our services that we provide. We do a lot of other things kind of beyond what we talked about in this short podcast here. 
but that would be a potentially uh, good resource to read some articles there and that may direct you in some other ways that can help you out. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Colin. And everyone, thank you for listening to our podcast. And remember, we're here to get you there.